morning it's me um oh i put a fantastically long well a post that got fantastically long thread of deliciousness all around um why we hang on to past hurts and oh and at the moment i'm deep diving into um exploring thoughts and feelings and creativity and a bit of magic and manifestation and and it's fascinating you know because i've got some really current material to work with hello hello good morning colleen <laughs> over in canada um canada is that a good canadian accent <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> so I've got some really current material to, to um, you know, when everything's smooth and hunky-dory and life's just ticking along and, and I don't know, you may, may be different to me and I get whispers in my ears, in my mind that say, it's time for a change. You need to let go of that. Why are you still hanging on to that? And this could be anything, like, possessions, relationships, um, homes. And that is the current thing at the moment, having to let go of this flat that Stephen and I live in. And so we got we got the um, notification that we needed to, to move on Friday. And we're now on Monday, are we? Yes. And then, so Friday, I had a little bit of a, oh my gosh, and went into Silver Synergy where which is the membership um, place of Silver Tent, where there's just a, an amazing circle of women, all of us um, doing our own, and this part of our life, 50 plus, challenging the, it, the, the whole thing is about challenging the, the, the myth of the, challenge, what's the, what's it called? It's, she's, Fanny's given it a proper name. I've got a little book. Yes, challenging the convention and rewriting the myth of the older woman and hey ho don't we need to be doing that um anyway so i went into synergy and um did a facebook live and saw my two-year-old face bobbing out of the screen because there's still you know when you get a still on a live uh, <laughs> i keep losing my signal that's just what it did you know it it captured me in that two-year-old five-year-old face you watch this one will do the same <laughs> and there I was in my stuff in my fear in my panic in my sadness in my uh, and then there's this little whisper going well I told you ages ago that you needed to leave and find somewhere new to live so it's it's really interesting isn't it this inner whispers that we get and I'm really interested now I'm as a coach, you know, I work a lot with people and we get, and I am saying, you know, got stuck in thoughts and feelings and belief systems and resistance. And I've, I've now got so many tools to, well, I haven't got so many. I've chosen some specific resources, tools that allow me to notice myself and then work with myself and all this history that I've got, which triggers old concerns, fears, doubts, worries, and move through, see them for what they are, which is really just a facade, just part of me that wants to feel safe and is encouraging me. And they're actually, then they're not safe. These thoughts and feelings aren't particularly safe because I can't machinate, is that the right word? I can't force, that's the word I'm looking for, my life to be a particular way. I can envision it, I can put it out as an energy that this is what I want and that's the hard bit I'm noticing because me and I don't know if I'm, I'm not much different to anybody else, in fact I'm not at all, we're all the same. I tend to set my, I tend to set my um, 
dreams, goals, desires to be a little bit less than what I really, really want. You know, my true heart's desire. It's almost like I'm settling. It's interesting, isn't it? Settling for less. Oh, that'll do. That'll, you know, that I'll, I can make that do. And um, <laughs> it's seen going through life in a make do life. You know, what's all that about? You know, oh, well, it's better to have something than nothing. And, you know, all that sort of stuff. So I'm 63, I'm 64 this year. And, you know, if, if I'm going to stretch into some new um, creativity, I've got, to, I've got to explore this world of creating magic and notice remembering that my thoughts and feelings aren't real. They're just based in past experiences. And sometimes they're highly inappropriate for um, what's happening in the now and extremely inappropriate for what I want in the future. So, you know, I work a lot with estrangement, you know, parents who have been um, cut out of their, or children, parents of children who have cut them out of their lives. So, I haven't said that very well, have I? <laughs> parents whose children have cut themselves out of their parents' lives. So even that is a different way of saying it to how I used to say it, which is parents who've been cut out of their children's lives as if they're the ones who have been, when actually the children, the adult children are the ones who are removing themselves from their parents' lives for whatever reasons. And there's a whole host of those. Um, and so, you know, a lot of us, those of us who have been hurt, you know, hang on to that hurt, which is what that post was all about, really. And I'm seeing it's a form of protection and actually it stops us. It limits, it's limited me, you know, it's limited me in my life. It's limited. And I'm beginning to see there's this lovely um, process that a lot of us go through around with the, in that caveat of labeling it all as healing. You know, there's certain things you have to really, you have to, see that there's wounds in there you have to see that there's um um things that we've gone through and um that have brought us deep pain and things that we've done as well that bring us deep pain you know the shadow side of us the the parts of us that we feel shame about or guilt about or you know those things that like stealing from your mother's purse when you were a youngster or um, never telling your parents that you had underage sex or, <laughs> or you know those things that we hide away I mean I know there's a lot more serious things than that you know some of us might have um, you know actually killed a person through war or whatever or road traffic accidents or what or even you know that intentional unconscious intention can you imagine carrying that around for the for the for your life, you know, how do you unpackage that? A lot of us have been sexually assaulted, raped, you know, all sorts of horrible things have happened to loads. Of we tend to sort of hide it away because it's we find it shameful or it's not socially acceptable. Or can you imagine if we had a, um, I, know, I used to I called it something once, an amnesty, you know, um, shame amnesty, where we rock up to these places and we say, you know, these are the things that I'm carrying that I'm ashamed about or feel guilty about or, you know, how lovely to be able to be able to recognise our humanity and our humanness in all of this and get rid of all that cack. So that's the first thing, you know, you, that's the hoovering out of our stuff that keeps us stuck in the pain of our experiences in the past. And so, you know, and I've done loads of work around that and got myself into a healthier, healthy, I'll own it. I've got myself into a healthy place now. Yeah, the grief still comes, the feelings still come. And it's interesting with us having to leave here, you know, it's triggering all my stuff, you know, my feelings. Primarily, it's feelings for me and it's thoughts. And I think that is where the attention is most useful to be focused 
if we can look at our feelings and thoughts and see them as something that is rooted in our past and may not necessarily be true right now, that's so helpful, you know, and I can feel most people's fears. Christian Mickelson here, thank you for this gift. Most people's fears are fears of our feelings. We'll do anything, anything to escape and we'll even kill ourselves to escape our feelings. And it's, it's in there, in our feelings, is where our power lies. You know, when we realise that this electrical energy thing that's going on in our body is old wiring, it might feel very current. And then sometimes it's really good if you're about to get run over by a car or you've got um, somebody coming at you with some sort of you know if you if your physical life's in threat under under threat it's really good to have that scary thing that makes you want to run away and or you know do the things that we need to do but when it's your adult child that stood in front of you and you and you're feeling those feelings as a result of a conversation it's so inappropriate or or in any situation where whether it be and I, I work a lot in relationships, so that's where I'm going to relate it to. You know, that you relate it to your boss or your or your sister or your parents or or the person at the bar, you know, or, you know, whatever. Those people who, who bring up that primal fear in you. And it's so inappropriate. And it closes us off to love. It closes off to connection. And we go out thinking that the world's against us and that everybody's a potential risk. <laughs> I'm being extreme here. And then that's what, because that's what we're looking for, that's what we see. We see danger everywhere. We see danger in people. Instead of going out there with seeing love in everybody and playfulness and connection and helpfulness and assistance and and congeniality where the heck did that come from Sandra Bullock <laughs> Miss Congeniality <laughs> that's an old film <laughs> so have a look you know as uh, in a way you know I know now that I feel this anxiety in the pit of my stomach and I go oh hello hello nice to see you I haven't felt you for a while instead of squashing it down running away from it and it's taken me some practice because i was a real drama queen i can still bring out the histrionics if i want to and and i'm not willing anymore i mean i'm willing to show my vulnerability and my small child in that sort of like fear and um sadness but I'm not willing to bring out the one that was argy-bargy with pointy elbows and, and fists and violence that I, that I used to be. It's hard to think that, you know, I used my body in a, in a very forceful way, you know. And, you know, that's what I got. That's what, that's the environment I lived in. That was the wiring. There was a lot of love there as well, which I think was sort of my saving you know, there was a lot of love and fun and, and there was also this other side, this dark, violent side that was scary as a youngster. You know, nowadays, I'd obviously, I'd deal with it a lot differently. But that old wiring still pops up, you know, and I, and I can see it and I think, no, nope, I'm not going to be bamboozled by that. You know, I'm not going to believe it. It's not true right now in this moment. And it's certainly not going to be helpful in me creating something new going forward. So it's really useful talking about this as well. For me, you know, maybe for you too, that, you know, check it out, check out. It's my anxiety. It's my fear. Because that's what it is. It's just fear. It's my fear of feeling and thinking. Because it was interesting, just before I jumped on here, I did this scan of the old thoughts that used to freak me out, mainly around death, mainly around how the chuff are we on this planet, like nobody knows why we're here, that sort of otherworldly life, <laughs> trying to understand life, you know, 
or is it how are we here how do i stay with my feet on the ground and not float in space all that sort of stuff and um so i did a quick run around those old thoughts to see if i was so interested in watching myself do that and and realizing that actually oh god i can't be can't be bothered i nearly said something else and i can't be bothered to get myself all worked up about that because this I, I suppose with getting older it's it one of the real loveliness about getting older is that those things don't seem to hook me in anymore like they did when I was a youngster I used to go into blind panic about why am I here on the planet and I often wondered where that seed came from and I think it was because um the way I make sense of it anyway is that um I was the last I'm the last one in my family and I was told that, you know, I knew that a baby before me had died and and that mum and dad had chosen to have me. And I suppose I, I sort of get it as a sort of a replacement, but I don't mean it like that. But it made me wonder that if that other child had lived, that I perhaps wouldn't have been born. And that sort of like spun me off into this creative imaginative <laughs> that I am want to do, you know. And I, I really like my imagination because that's where, I mean, I can cook it up into being a nightmare in there or I can cook it up into being absolutely magical. And it's choosing, for me, it's choosing the magical rather than the worst case scenario or the that'll do scenario because that's somewhere in the middle isn't it there's this worst case scenario and then there's this uh that'll do we'll just other than there's this dream that i have you know and i guess all of us have got a dream in there and i guess the majority of us think nah, we'll just go for the make do <laughs> i mean in my mind i've got this picture of this house that I want to live in and it's round it's got glass to the front it overlooks south facing obviously it overlooks some beautiful land it's got it's round it's got a upstairs sort of mezzanine type space it's all open plan it's got little bubbles on the sides as well which are the the hot house and the wet house you know so you've got your wet stuff and you but all the living space is all in this central bit and then it's got this partially glassed ceiling so when you're laid in bed on the night and it's got a wardrobe up there very minimal <laughs> wooden floors with rugs and but beautiful and elegant as well as rustic and basic and um and it's got a little bit of a hill at the back of it as well which shields it from the northern, so I think it might be in England, <laughs> from the northern weather. And uh, I've drawn it. Will I ever get to manifest this? Who knows? I've forgotten about it for a while, actually. There was a time when I was really dreaming it in and thinking about it and seeing myself in it, and I can. So that's my dream home. And then it's part of a community. So there's over the over the hill, there's another. There's Fred and Doris over there. <laughs> I don't know Fred and Doris, but you know what I mean. Next door, but quite a way away. And then there's this community building that's also round where we rock up and share meals. You know, somebody will say, it's got a kitchen in there and laundry area and whatnot. And somebody will, like, telepathically, because that's where we're going, Send us a message, say, I'm cooking tonight, so if anybody wants to come, if not, it'll go in the freezer for another time. You know, oh, I'm sure there's spaces like that already. Anyway, so thoughts and feelings aren't real. When I first heard that, I was so resistant to that. <laughs> My bloody thoughts and feelings are real. I can feel them and I'm thinking them, so they're definitely real. And the sort of like the backstory to that is that they are based in the past. They're not in the now. Like if you were in the now, if we were always in the now, you'd actually choose 
how to think and feel. And sometimes I can and sometimes I'm thinking, oh look, look what I'm choosing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to choose this, I but you are choosing it. Oh, well, I'll choose it then. <laughs> we nuts, aren't we? Absolutely. But the most lovely of nuts, I have to say. We're all confused. We're all feeling our way in the dark. And that's the thing about awakening and becoming awake, becoming aware, becoming self-aware. I mean, we think... I think we think, maybe it's not true, that we can solve it with rules and laws and wars and and domination and control. I think it's the control thing that I think we think we can manage ourselves, each other and life in general. And I'm sure that, you know, the people who are creating robots and AI, AI? And all that sort of that stuff think that control or laws people who are I, I don't know but you know this this thing that we can control nature you know and it's it's absolutely ridiculous and that you know like and i can be in charge of myself which is different to being in control i think you know i can be in charge and that that comes with responsibility and choosing consciously choosing a response has been one of the hardest things that I've ever had to get a hold of because I'm so in this back brain, this reptilian amygdala type brain, if that's real, you know, like if we believe the research and all that. But it makes sense to me. A lot of this makes sense, you know, and it's like that was driving me, you know, and um and it's not now, and it take it's taken me years to be fully, and I'm sure I'm still unpacking it, how to fully be in charge of me and in conscious choosing in <laughs> each and every moment. And it, it's not hard. It, it's not hard. It's not easy. It hasn't been easy for me. I can imagine it's easy for some other people who are perhaps more connected to... Um, awareness and awakening i think i think there's a lot of young people coming through being born now who have way more switched onness and i sometimes wonder you know if all these this extra labelings that people have got this adhd and all the different variants of all of that um as a result of people not wanting to fit into this shoehorned into this culture that we've created this controlled culture which shoehorns us down into education a particular type of education and then into a particular working world becoming a drone really in a system that is actually self implode well it's imploding now isn't it it's unsustainable we kind of know that we're kind of stuck in it and it, it's how do we shift that around you know and that's i'm so interested in the power of our mind and it's um happy partner the feelings uh, you'll know when you experience and i don't know whether you still experience it coming from the external or from the internal and my experience of me is that more often than not, my joy, my, it's almost like I can choose it now, I can choose to open my heart. I can choose to feel that effervescent bubble. What Francesco's, the creative silver tent, what she calls that, the um, childlike, evoking a childlike innocence, curiosity. As soon as I hear those words, I can switch into that and tune into that. And yes, external stuff does give me pleasure, does give me um, an uplift. And yet I'm not, I'm beginning to see that I can't depend on that. What I can depend on is my own internal reservoir of hormones and, um, I, there is a scientific word and I can't remember what it is. 
I can depend on my internal systems to bring me peace, love, joy, connection, rather than it being as a result of having something lovely happen to me on the external. And that's the same with this letter on Friday. You know, I, for a moment, you know, I went back into human animal, amygdala, all that sort of stuff and watched myself in that because that for me is where I get to be able to flick it and think, that's all old stuff, Sunday, come on. You know, wherever you live, you know, it's going to be great. And just because this has come from the external doesn't mean I, that I have to fall apart and switch off and close down and not participate. And, and now I'm having a little bit of a conversation in my head around grief, you know, well, how does grief play into this, you know, and allowing these feelings to move through, you know, and I've got a big emotional portfolio. <laughs> Not only is it big, it's quite, um, what's the word, extensive, like deep. You know, if I feel, I feel deeply. So, and I love that, mostly. <laughs> and I know that these feelings are just temporary and I also know that they're not really real, you know. And it's what being human is all about. We're, we are feeling things. I find all of this fascinating because this for me is like um, personal mastery. Um, and being in charge and being um, useful in the world. Being part of the creative, regenerative, loving world that we that we all, I think, yeah, we all do. That's all that anybody ever wants is to feel love. And I think for me, that's a, if you've got that little bud inside, it, that is something worth n nourishing. And all the stuff in the past that's hurt like hell, you know, it's, yeah, there is a process to go through and then somehow it's not that I don't hurt and I don't feel it's that I can choose how to respond way more than I ever could when I was younger it's great it's getting old <laughs> and I do deal with a lot of pain in my body as well you know so you know there is there is all that to it's really funny isn't it there's some some parts you know there's the benefits and then there's the things you have to deal with and the quality, you know, this is something that I remember noticing and learning through my dad, really, that the quality of life is so subjective, you know. When you get to the end, when you get near the end and somebody, a younger person saying, oh, I don't, you know, like, don't put me down before I get like that. And you think, and that you, if the older person is loving their life because they're sitting in a wheelchair somebody's parked them up somewhere and they're full of love and vigour and I'm talking about that particular scenario, you know, that they're full of connection and I've seen it. I've seen older people who are still engaged and participate and find a way to to be really in their life still and not and not like we perhaps perceive it as younger people, like it being oh I couldn't deal with that you know I want to go before I get like that you know and I don't know where that came from it just snuck in at the end there anyway thank you for joining me on this Monday morning and uh, I'll speak to you again real soon thank you for joining me lots of love bye for now bye bye